Paul, recent events around ESCOM have resurfaced the issue of energy in South Africa and also across the continent. What do you make of where we are? We have to first of all look at uh, the unique uh, situation that the African, uh, South Africa and the African continent uh, is in. We quite often compare ourselves to Europe and more developed uh, nations and uh, really their energy infrastructure is so well developed and developed over such a long period of time that it's not always uh, useful to look overseas for every solution that you could uh, wish for. There's varying schools of thought of how we've become to an energy crisis. Some saying, well, it's poor lack of proper planning. The other side is it's indicative of the economic growth that Africa has had. Where would you put your view? Certainly we've, uh, we've come from a situation where as a, a very centrally controlled uh, monopolistic uh, supply of electricity, uh, which Eskom has always been, and uh, moving into a situation where the government has taken over responsibility for integrated planning of our energy uh, horizon. And there's been some uh, hiccups along, along the way there. And historically, Eskom, of course, has been highly dependent on coal-fired power. Uh, and we've moved into a new environment where that's not totally acceptable on, a, on, the, on the international stage. Now we have to have a much more diversified base. And that transition is, uh, is quite problematical to uh, navigate. Uh, on the back of that, yes, we have had uh, economic growth. And had we had the economic growth that was maybe forecast four or five years ago, we would be in maybe even more serious problems now. You talk about alternative sources. Um, we've seen wind, solar, hydro. Mm -hmm. What are the best alternatives for South Africa and the African continent? South Africa is very well endowed with energy resources. Uh, we've always historically had a very high coal-powered base for very good reason in that we've got lots of reasonably accessible, uh, reasonable quality coal. And it is, you know, a good source of uh, baseload power. There's a, a lot of clamour about moving towards uh, renewables and renewables can't possibly uh, replace the coal-fired fleet that we, we have. They can supplement it and go some way to uh, alleviating it but remember that they're, uh, they're not totally dependable power sources. The wind blows when it feels like it and the sun shines 12 or 14 hours of the day. Are you intimating maybe we should look at things like nuclear, for example? Well, nuclear is one possibility, but uh, if you look uh, around the world, uh, if you look uh, at Europe, I mean, probably about 50% of Europe's energy demand is now satisfied by gas. Uh, and we hear a great deal of talk about the uh, gas uh, boom on the uh, east coast of uh, southern Africa. And I think if we can tap into that, that might be a, you know, a very useful uh, way of uh, alleviating the situation. In the late uh, 70s, 80s in the UK, for example, there was a so-called dash for gas, which uh, now results in gas being the predominant supplier of electricity there. Using that European example as well, much of the demand is also being met by, I guess, more efficient use of energy. Efficiency is one part of it, but there's a whole raft of what they call demand-side solutions that you can bring into place. Uh, if you have a fully uh, market-based uh, energy uh, electricity supply industry, you can then have intermediary, intermediaries in terms of uh, buying and selling bulk power, hedging type uh, arrangements, and normal sort of market type structures instead of where we at the moment have one buyer and one seller really. And the technology, I guess, on optimization has also improved. Are we tapping into that as much as we should? One of the problems with electricity is you can't really store it. You have to uh, use it or lose it, really. Uh, hydro uh, schemes where there's a pump storage component is a very useful way of uh, storing and by far and away the most efficient way of bulk storage of electricity. But there's other optimum ways of uh, modifying the grid structure so that you can have distributed uh, electricity embedded within the grid. Um, in Germany, for example, a significant uh, fraction of homes now have uh, PV, solar PV installations on their rooftops. Uh, we don't have that at the moment, largely because of the uh, regulatory framework and also because of the economics. It's not really a cheap way for individual users to, to go. 
in South Africa where we do have a number of projects that are running, building up new power stations, um, and there's lots more planned all over the continent. The economic cycle that we find ourselves in, where commodity prices are starting to lower and revenues aren't there to fund us, where will the funding come from? One of the big problems that you actually have is that in any uh, competitive power landscape, you have to have cost-reflective tariffs. You won't get uh, private participation any, unless you have some means of having fully cost-reflective uh, tariffs. You know, people will only invest if they can make a reasonable return. And maybe that is one of the key things that we have to drive to is that, you know, the electricity supply is, is a social good, but it has to be done in an economically viable way. We've seen time and time again, I mean, if I look at the power stations that are being built in South Africa internationally where some of the plants have taken delayed for up to 10 years, if you look at the Finnish example with the nuclear power station, what are some of the underlying reasons there? I think one of the things that uh, a lot of uh, big projects run into uh, problems and usually um, if you look at the underlying reasons for that it's because of insufficient planning right up front. Um, there's a number of techniques um, to uh, enhance project management and program management but fundamentally it's about just poor project management overall. Is that maybe a skill or an area that's been overlooked in our planning? Generally, in the whole infrastructure engineering space, you'll often find that people are involved on projects where you think, ah, if only they, we'd thought about this five years ago. And uh, I think it's a general case in the infrastructure planning space is that that program management and integrated holistic planning just isn't there. If you were to give advice to some of the governments that are grappling with this issue, mm -hmm. what are the key elements that you would advise well, I think it has to be part of a whole integrated development plan. You can't just have a, an energy development plan on, it, on its own. It's got to go hand in glove with the, uh, an industrial development plan, an agricultural development plan, an economic development plan. Paul, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.